Yes, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation to make this uh, keynote speech here. I'm really happy to do this. Um, of course, we all know that we are in extremely interesting time. This, this morning was a, a lot of discussions on this. I even will talk less about Trump than my free speaker. I really would like to convince you that in, in addition to Trump, there is a lot of very interesting things going on uh, in, in the shorter and in the longer term uh, on the macroeconomic side that is very relevant uh, for the long, longer term development. Maybe in the discussion where we can come back to Trump because, I mean, I could spend one hour talking about his, uh, his uh, economic ideas. But uh, <clears throat> my presentation will be uh, about the extraordinary macroeconomic times, especially on the interest rate side. I will uh, cover the following five points. First, I will make the point that is quite quite clear, I think, but uh, it's important to, to, to make it right at the beginning that we have two extraordinary interest rate developments. One is, of course, very well known, it's the more shorter run, but there is also a longer run interest rate development that is very interesting. And then we go to, to discussing the reasons behind these special developments. Why the secular fall in long-term interest rates? That's the, the question about the long-term interest rates. And then we were, of course, also turned to the short-run, uh, short-term interest rates that are more directly influenced uh, by monetary policy. Um, here, one issue I would like to mention a little bit more in detail, it's the question of negative policy interest rates. Uh, a lot of discussion has been going on about this. I will discuss whether this, there is something special about them. And then, of course, I mean, that's the question that everybody is interested in is, uh, will it continue like this? So will interest rates normalize? And I think, I mean, Trying to explain the reasons behind the recent developments is exactly the point where you start to try to see what will be the likely development uh, for short and long-term interest rates. So we prepare for this, for answering this question. I will not be able to answer this question, of course, but I, I will try to give you some, some thoughts about this. So let's start with these two extraordinary interest rate developments. The first is that we really have a secular, I mean, you have to be careful with, with terms like secular, but I think it's really justified to talk about a secular fall in long-term interest rates. For very long-term, long-term nominal interest rates are falling. And then, of course, the thing that is more recent, that more recently uh, came into the forefront is the de development for short-term, especially policy interest rates. And this is, of course, linked to the financial crisis. The financial crisis, the reaction to the financial crisis that Pre, that really uh, created a notion of liquidity, and with this, of course, extremely low short-term interest rates. Um, <clears throat> just for the, for the figures here, you see, we, we could even go back to the 80s, but this is from the 90s to today. These are yields on, on government bonds, so a very, very certain, uh, very, very stable uh, uh, return on very stable bonds, and here you see clearly that we have this fall. It doesn't depend which country you take, whether it takes Switzerland, Germany, the US, other countries. You see that it started in the 90s around 6 to 8 percent, and then you have a fall for a very long period of time until today, where we are basically at zero, very, very near zero. So a clear long-term fall in, in interest rates. And then, the more recent thing is, of course, the policy interest rates. Here you see the policy interest rates, the short-term policy interest rate of the SMB, the ECB, and the Fed. And here the same story for all three of them. Uh, before the financial crisis, you had a stepwise increase. Uh, you had a very good, uh, the great moderation, good economic times. You had an increase of interest rates, of, of policy interest rates. And then right after the crisis started, they fell like, like a rock. You had a very aggressive reaction. I will come back to this aggressive uh, reaction later, but you see it already here in the picture, very aggressive reaction. And basically, I mean, this is something really amazing. The policy rates now for eight years are rock bottom, extremely low. And as you know, this was not the entire uh, monetary policy reaction because we also had unconventional policy. I come back to this. So what we see basically is that, sh that, in, that the longer term interest rates and the shorter term interest rates are really falling uh, for a long period of time. And now we try to come to the reasons behind this. Let's start <coughs> with the long term interest rates. Um, <coughs> here, this is an ex extreme important definition. By definition, the nominal interest rates uh, are just a combination of two things. It's the combination of the real interest rates, so what you get in real terms, forgetting about money, what you get in real terms if you invest your money, 
And the second thing, of course, is inflationary expectations. It's not the inflation itself, but it's the expectations of inflation, because if you, uh, if you invest your money, you expect some return tomorrow, and therefore it's important how the development is to tomorrow, and there you have form to form expectations. I think this is quite, I mean, it seems quite obvious, but it's important to get back to this. If you want to explain this long-term fall in, in interest rates, you, either it's inflationary expectations, or it's real, uh, it's real interest rates, or it's a combination of both. So the possible explanations to, to make this, this to, to combine this, either we have a fall in inflationary expectations, a long-term fall in inflationary expectation that leads to this, to this fall in interest rates, or we have a fall in real interest rates, so it's really about the, the, the real development of the economy, not so much the monetary uh, development, or a combination of both. Just to add this, because this is usually something that, that you would maybe uh, mention as well, as well, there are things like risk premia, so if, if, we, if we look at government bonds especially, then we could say that maybe an explanation could be that we have a fall in risk premia, um, so an increased solvency of the government. I just would say for the countries that we looked at, uh, at the, uh, with the figures before, this is not very relevant, because these are stable, developed countries where Basically, government bonds, well, nothing is sure, of course, nothing is certain. But as far as something can be certain, uh, it's, it's the solvency of, 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 these, uh, of, of these governments standing behind these, these, uh, these bonds. So basically, we can really con concentrate on, on the two things, <clears throat> on the fall in inflationary expectations and fall in, interest, in, in real interest rates. So the question is, which of the two factors is responsible? There, the best way to look at it is to check uh, interest rates for uh, inflation-protected bonds. Because by, defi defini by definition, if you look at inflation-protected bonds, yeah, you are basically, you, have a, uh, yeah, you do not have to care about the inflation. It's really the real development that, de that, that determines what is the, the returns on, on inflation-protected bonds. Now, we don't have some, such, a, so, such bonds in Switzerland, but of course we have it in other countries, and we can look uh, at the development in some of these other countries. Um, <clears throat> these are two examples. It's the United States and the UK, where you have here the, nom the normal uh, bonds, and you, here you have the, the inflation-protected bonds. Of course, the inflation-protected bonds get a lower return. That's, that's obvious, given the, given the definition. But the interesting thing is just look at the difference between the two, because the difference between the two, that's about the inflationary expectation. Or you could it even put more directly, the inflation-protected bonds are, are very near something like the real interest rate, because they correct basically for expected inflation. And either way you look at it, there is a clear message coming out of this. The message is that it's really the real interest rate that seems to have fallen. So the results are Inflation and inflation exp expectation are rather stable in the recent past, so the difference, of course, it fluctuates a little bit, the difference, but the difference is quite stable over the long term. We have not something like this. We are not a gap between the two, uh, between the two uh, figures. And <clears throat> what you clearly see is that the inflation-protected bonds also you have a clear fall in returns. So the re re result is really that the major part of the fall in long-term interest, nominal interest rates is due to falling real interest rates. Okay, that's one answer, but of course the next question is, if, if it's long-term real interest rates, why this fall in long-term interest, real interest rates? So what can be behind this fall in long-term uh, real interest rates? And this is, of course, I mean, this is one of the most important macroeconomic questions because the, the, the long-term real interest rate, the long-term development of the real interest rates, that's really about the profitability of the economies, so to speak. And it's really very interesting to look at the factors that explain uh, wh where this comes from, this, this fall in real interest rates. Here, just a, a little bit, I have to put in a little bit theory. There are of course, tons of things that have an influence on the, on the real interest rates. But you can basically make a distinction between two categories of explanations. The first category of, of explanation is that it has something to do with supply and demand for funds, for funds to invest. So the supply of funds is basically the savings, the savings that people are saving. They're looking for investment opportunities, and the de demand for this is, of course, the demand for funds for investment uh, purposes, for real investment. I mean, not financial investments, on the, but, but in, in, in a real sense. 
So, of course, supply and demand has, has an influence on the price, and the price of supply and demand of saving and of, 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 of funds is the real interest rate. And the second uh, possibility, and of course the two can be linked in different ways, but the th second thing is really that it has something to do with falling long-term economic growth. That we really have, for whatever reasons, the long-term uh, growth rate of the economy has fallen. And I think it's very important if we try to understand what happened and if we try to make a forecast about the interest rate situation in the years to come, that we analyze these two, these two possibilities. Let's first talk about savings and investment and then talk about economic growth. So savings and investments to make a very, that's the only uh, microeconomic graph that you will see in this, in this presentation, but I think it's, it, it's, it's quite straightforward. What you see here is basically the market for, for, for investable funds. You have the savings and the investment. The savings is the, is the supply of, of these funds that are to be invested. And the investment is, is the demand. Uh, the, the demand side is the investment. Of course, the higher the real interest rates, the more you are likely it's, it's attractive to save, and the less attractive it is to invest. That's the reason why the savings rate, savings curve has this slope, and the investment curve has this slope. Basically, we start at this situation at zero here, where we have I and S. And now, if we try to explain the fall in real interest rates by savings and investment, there are two possibilities. Either we have an increase in savings, so for whatever reason, additional savings comes on, on this market, and it's like, for, which is the same for oil or sugar or any other product, if you have additional supply and the demand stays, then you have a shift of the supply curve and the price falls. So the price of the real interest rate falls if we have additional supply. That's the supply side argument. But of course, it could also be an investment argument. So the investment side argument would be, for whatever reason, less funds are, are uh, demanded for investment purposes. And if this is the case, then we have a shift of the investment uh, schedule to the, to the left, which means less investment for, for, for each uh, interest rate level. And this, of course, again, has, has the, uh, the effect of a fall. If we have keep savings constant and the investment is reduced, the real interest rate is reduced. Again, the intuition is very simple. If demand falls, prices fall. That's the, 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 that's the microeconomic intuition behind this. And of course, it could be a, a combination of both. That's what the, what the whole scheme shows you. It's a fall, uh, an increase in savings and a fall in investment, which can lead to the strange situation that we have the same amount of savings and investment in the end, but at very different prices. The prices can fall very strictly very strongly, so that real interest rates are falling. And this is something that we actually see in the, in the in, in, if we look at the long-term figures, we see that, that we have a fall in the, in the real interest rates without having a, a strong fall in investment saving per se, the sum of saving and investment, which speaks a little bit in the direction that it could be a combination of both. So now we try to look at what could be the reasons first why savings have increased in the, last, in the last decades, and then we look why investment could have fallen. And there are, in effect, some, some arguments here. These are the possible uh, reasons for, for uh, the secular increases in savings. The first is demographics. The demographic uh, argument is the following. Usually, if you, you, during the time where you work, you save for your, for your retirement, and when you retire, you use your savings for, for financing the retirement. Now, what you certainly can say is, due to the, to the, to the demographic development, to the baby boomers development, in the last two or three decades, we had a lot of people being in the working age, in the working age and people are not yet retired, who are saving for their retirement. And this is not something only in, you see only in Switzerland, you see in very many countries where you have this baby boomer uh, uh, phenomenon in the demographic development. And th this is quite a, a reasonable thing to say that because a lot of people are now in the working age and are trying to, saving, to save for their, for their retirement, you have a, an increase in saving, uh, and this is one of the possibilities why the savings uh, supply increases. Okay, a second possibility, which is also uh, analyzed by a part of the literature, is that it could have to do with uh, more unequal income, income distribution. I mean, you know that this is something that is very, very widely discussed at the moment, 
that we could have a shift in the income distribution. By the way, in Switzerland, you do not see a, a lot if you look at the macro data, but in other countries, say the US, you of course see a spreading between uh, in, in, in some important measures of income distribution. And here the intuition is the following. If you have more people who have a lot of funds and some people who basically consume a, a big part of their funds, then it could be the case that in, indeed the saving, all over, overall savings increases. That's the, the second possible explanation. I'm not so convinced that this makes, makes, a, big, makes a big part of the, of, the, of, the, of the story, but it could be. And the last is, of course, is something that you really see that a lot of developing countries, especially emerging economies, for example, the countries that were hit by the Asian crisis, have a tendency to, to, uh, to insure themselves against something like the, like the Asian crisis by saving more for the case that, that they, they have financial crisis. China is an example, but other East Asian countries too have, have really tried to, to save more. And if overall they save more, there is more savings coming on the, on the markets, which is also an, an argument for additional savings. So you have different possible explanations and quite plausible explanations why in the last two decades, uh, or two to three decades, we have an increase of savings. Then the investment side, again, here some arguments. One that you clearly see is that capital goods overall, uh, that the relative price of capital has decreased in the, last, in the last decades. So to put it very simple, it gets cheaper to have the same, the same amount of investment than, you, than it was uh, some decades ago. And this, of course, means that you need less, less financing for your investment. A second uh, element that you see in some in some countries, especially in countries that, that have long, long time not invested in infrastructure, is a fall in a reduction in public investment. Of course, not since the financial crisis. There was a lot of public, uh, uh, public investment, public consumption going on. But overall, in the longer term, a certain reduction in public investment. And the last argument is you could have an increase in risk premium. An increase in risk premium meaning that the risk-free uh, that the difference between the risk-free returns and the returns for more risky that have increased in the last decades. These are so the, the most important arguments why investment uh, could, could, could have fallen. Okay, that's savings and investment. Let's turn to economic growth. In economic growth, here the intuition is the following. Just make a, make a thought experiment. The thought experiment is that you ask yourself what should be the return of a very strongly diversified Swiss portfolio, for example. A portfolio that, that more or less rebuilds the Swiss economy as far as it goes. Of course, it's not, never possible because not, not everything is, is, is traded, but to have a very broadly defined portfolio. What should be, what should be the, the rate of return of this, of this portfolio? Well, the answer is, if it's really representative, it should, be, it should be the dynamics of the economy. And what is the dynamics of the economy? It's the growth rate the economic growth rate. That's, that's the rate of return of the Swiss economy, so to say. It's the real economic growth rate, so about 2% a year uh, on average. And this means that economic growth is more or less the real return of the... Oh, sorry. That economic growth is more or less the real return of the economy and is very much linked to the real interest rate. So one explanation that is really could be very important is that if we have a fall in, in economic growth, in real economic growth, then we would observe a fall in the real interest rate. Now is of course a question, why should the long-term growth rate fall? Well, here I, again a little bit of theory, but very simple. Economic growth can be decomposed in two components. If, you, if a country grows, if more people work, or if the people work more productively. These are the two sources of economic growth. So you see it here, growth of GDP per capita is a combination of more hours worked and, and more produced per hour worked, which is, which is just labor productivity. And here is, of course, the, the possibility that you observe a fall in real economic growth because of, there are two possibilities, because we have a fall of the number of hours worked that could be to, due to demographic aging, and the second argument is that we could have fallen growth of labor productivity. This is the entire discussion you certainly know about secular stagnation, that we could have some kind of a secular fall in the real return of the economy. 
Of these two arguments for the last two or three decades, certainly the second argument is more to be taken seriously because, as I said before, because the baby boomers are now in the, in the workforce, there hasn't been a very strong shift uh, in, 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 the, in the amount of, of, of workers. That could change for the future. I come back to this. So these are, pos these are basically the possibilities, the, the, the different reasons why we could have this fall in real interest rates. Now, the Bank of England, two economists of the Bank of England wrote a very interesting paper uh, uh, so about a year ago where they tried to disentangle these different effects. Of course, this is an estimation. These are not the true numbers, but they make especially exactly these kind of, 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 of calculations where I showed you the basic ideas behind it, and they come to the following conclusion. Since 1918, there's a reduction of, of real interest rates <clears throat> there's a reduction of, of, uh, of, of interest rates of about 4.5%. That's a, an average number. And now what they do is they try to disentangle this fall in real interest rate to the different effects. And what they find is that more savings make up about 1.6% of this 4.8%, that less investment also uh, in, in, in has, a, has a clear effect, and that falling economic growth has about 1% of this effect. And the rest is unexp unexplained, about 0.5%. What this clearly shows you is, this is an indication, it's not a proof, of course, I mean, this is hard to, 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 to really disentangle the effects, but what this shows you is that indeed, the fall in real interest rates has a lot to do with these savings investment developments and with the developments of economic growth. And if you think about the future, then it's of course the question, what will happen, uh, what will happen in the future? I come back to this at the end. Uh, Going, uh, going to these numbers here. Okay, so that's the long-term interest rates. Let's now turn to the short-term interest rates. That's the, se the second macroeconomic phenomenon that we really have a, a strong fall since the financial crisis. So short-term policy rates are rock bottom since the financial crisis. I showed you the figure for, for this. In addition, as you know, the central banks try to influence longer-term interest rates by doing quantitative easing, by not only reduce in the very short-term interest rates that they directly influence, but to really try to, by buying long-term bonds, to bring down the, the, the returns on longer-term bonds as well. This is un unconventional monetary policy. You basically see it in the central bank's balance sheets. And it's always very uh, impressive to look at this, at this figure. I mean, already the, the, the short-term interest rates I showed you at the beginning, the conventional monetary policy were quite... Uh, were quite impressive, but that's really impressive. Because, I mean, what you try here is to say, if, if a central bank does unconventional policy, what's the policy, what is it doing? What, it's, is it, what it is doing, it buys long-term bonds and gives liquidity out for these long-term bonds. Which means that the long-term bonds, they own then the long-term bonds, which means that the asset side of their, of their balance sheet increases. And this is a measure for this. This is an index that is 100 in, 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 the, in the year 2000. And what you see is basically that this central bank balance sheet is an extremely boring thing in normal times. So before the financial crisis, it's basically constant. I mean, it's not exactly constant, but compared to what happened afterwards, it's basically constant. And then after the beginning of the financial crisis, you see a, a real explosion of the central bank balance sheet which means that we have really an, an extreme expansion of liquidity. You see it for the, SM, for, the, for, for the Fed, certainly that's, I mean, quantitative easing was invented by the Fed, and the Fed was the first that clearly enacted it uh, aggressively. And here you see that the Fed, it started by about, at about 150, now it's at about 750. So a, a six-fold increase of their balance sheet by these kind of operations. The ECP looks harmless compared to this, but I mean, the ECP, you know, that they, they started with this policy, then they retreated a little bit, but in the last, in the last uh, one, one or two years, they aggressively try to do quantitative easing, and you see it here that their balance sheet is increasing as well. The SMB, the Swiss National Bank, is of course a completely other story. Well, the effect is the same, but I mean, you never heard in Switzerland that we are now trying to make quantitative easing and that we try to kickstart the economy by, by, uh, by really having this long-term investment by the central bank. 
the reason why we have this strong increase here in, 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 the, in the Swiss, uh, in, the, in the SMB balance sheet, is just the exchange rate. I mean, these kind of aggressive monetary policy in our trading partners, of course, increase the liquidity of, 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 of these currencies extremely. And the Swiss National Bank was forced to basically follow this kind of policy in order to avoid an uh, extreme appreciation of the Swiss franc. And if you look at the composition of the, cent of the, of the Swiss uh, National Bank's uh, balance sheet, you clearly see that it's, it's really, it was the investment in foreign currency. It was basically stabilizing the, the exchange rate. But of course, the effect, if you look at the effect, it's really, it's stunning. I mean, the, the SMB basically at the beginning of the financial crisis was very near to 100, and now we are, we are approaching 800. And because the SMB is still intervening in the, in the foreign exchange markets, it's one of the instruments that they're using. The other are negative interest rates, I come to this. But one is clearly intervention in the foreign exchange market. You, there is clearly a tendency of increase of the central bank balance sheet uh, uh, at the moment. So if you look at these figures, if you look at the short-term uh, policy rates, and if you look at these, of, of, at these quantitative easing uh, effects, of course, the obvious question is why this extreme expansion of, monet of monetary policy? And here, I mean, the question is, uh, the, the, the answer is, is quite easy. The financial crisis was a very severe macroeconomic shock. It was a macroeconomic shock that it was comparable to what we saw at the beginning of the Great Depression. So we had a very strong shock for the financial crisis, and this led to, for different reasons, of course, to big, to, to big stress in banks, and banks really strongly cut back on loans. In many countries, not in Switzerland, but in many countries, you had very many elements of a, of a, of a, of a clear credit crunch. A credit crunch meaning that, that indeed even good investment projects no longer got any financing or had, pro had problems getting financing from banks. The conventional monetary policy I showed you right at the beginning very much lead, uh, reached their lower ground. I mean, they reduced the short-term interest rates from, from about 4% to basically zero within, within weeks or within months. And they reached the lower bound very quickly. And it was clearly, uh, the, the consensus was that to stabilize the economy after this very severe shock of the financial crisis, more was needed. And the more that was needed was then these different elements of, of quantitative easing. In a way, you could say that the monetary lesson of the Great Depression had, had been learned. I mean, we economists are frequently criticized that we didn't forecast the financial crisis, or very, many, very few of us did that. But one way I try to a little bit to defend the economists is to say, it was not that easy to, to make this prediction. I mean, many, many uh, people at the financial markets that earn their money by doing this kind of forecast didn't forecast the financial crisis. It was hard to forecast. But at least what the economists did, they learned from the last time when something like this happened. Because people are too less aware that the situation in 2008 was very similar to the situation in uh, 1929, when the, when the Great Depression began. We had this combination of a, of, a, of a banking crisis, of a very f strong fall in, in, uh, in, market, in market rates in different cases, and we had the, we had the danger of, a, of, of really a basically bankruptcy of big parts of the, of, the, of the banking system. So the situation was very similar, and it was a, a situation not only in one country, but in very many countries at the same time. And at the Great Depression, one of the reasons why the Great Depression became the Great Depression is exactly because central banks didn't react properly. Central banks basically reacted by, by not expanding too much their, their monetary base. They basically said, well, we have to keep our monetary base more or less constant, and they didn't aggressively try to increase the monetary base, which led to the situation that the, the, the banks that cried for liquidity didn't have any access to, to, to liquidity, and this led to, to, to these big bank failures in many uh, European countries and in the US uh, at the beginning of the Great Depression. And this, less, this was really analyzed a lot, this, this case. And it was a lucky coincidence that Ben Bernanke was one of the scholars that, uh, that re who, really, uh, who really made this analysis very, very uh, thoroughly. And here, clearly, the reaction was to very aggressively try to increase liquidity at the beginning of the crisis to avoid this kind of, of banking failures that you saw in 29 and 30 and 31. 
Of course, there were banking crises, there were some banks that didn't survive, but compared to what happened in the Great Depression, of course, in most of the, of the, of the developed countries, we didn't have this kind of a, of a, of a, strong, uh, of a strong depression. So the monetary lesson of the Great Depression was learned. And therefore, we had really a, a very aggressive stimulation. Why did I spend some time on making this comparison to the Great Depression? Just to try to convince you, at least that is my opinion, that this monetary policy reaction was absolutely correct. It was the right thing to do. Without this kind of reaction, we really would have risked the second Great Depression. But of course, because this, this, the, the medicine was so extreme, now we have to be very careful that we, that, that we don't have the, the, the side effects of this, of, 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 this, of this medication, which means that now that the financial crisis is behind us to a certain degree, and the liquidity is still extremely large in, in the system, we have some dangers that are, that, that are building up. The, risk, the first risk is the obvious risk for price stability. This is just a, a figure I, that Peter Bernholz uh, published in the, in, in, in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung recently, which is really interesting. What you see here is the development of the monetary base. The monetary base is the money that the central bank injects by giving, giving the money directly to the, to, to, to the commercial banks. This is M0 for the economists among you. And M0 is just this, is the monetary base. And then, of course, usually the banks start to give out loans, and then the, the, the money increases to M M1 and M2 and M3. And what this figure just shows you is, is how extremely large the, this liquidity uh, increase was, was, especially for Switzerland. I mean, M0 was 100 in 2008, and now it's at, two, two, at 1,100. So, and the, in the other, I mean, the others look, look pale compared to, compared to Switzerland, but also for the others, we have a very, very strong uh, liquidity uh, increase. Of course, as long as this liquidity is at the, at, the, at the accounts of the banks with the central bank, they have not an inflationary effect. I mean, that's exactly the, the, the point about the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, M0 stayed constant and because the banks were so short for in liquidity, this was an extremely restrictive monetary policy. Here we could more or less keep the monetary, uh, the monetary policy quite uh, expansionary by exp ex increasing the liquidity. But of course, if the situation normalizes, when we get in the, sit in the situation where, the, where banks start to, to, to act as they did before the crisis, this kind of, of, of monetary base is much too large. And therefore, the, the big question here is, do the central banks find the correct moment for, for cutting back this? I come back to this, to this extremely important point in a moment. So one risk, is certainly for, one risk is certainly for price stability. A second risk is, of course, th that we have, we have a risk for financial stability. Because of this, of this extreme uh, low interest rate develop, uh, environment, we have on the asset sides and on the li liability sides of the banks, we have additional risks. So the risk on the asset side is a fall in the quality of the loans, or an, uh, because the yields are so low, uh, exposure to higher yield, riskier financial instruments. And of course, on the liability side, it's very cheap to, to, to be invested uh, uh, short term and on a wholesale, on a wholesale financing is, is, is very cheap. And this, if we have a fast, this is okay as long as the interest rate is so low, then we don't have a direct problem. But of course, if the interest rate starts to rise and rise quite quickly, then many banks could come into, 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 into problems. So just to make the point clear, the, the expansion, the monetary expansion, there is no discussion that this was extremely vital to do this. But there are big risks with this kind of, of, of monetary policy that we ne never had before. We never had such an expansionary monetary policy before. And the, the big challenge is really how to cut back this. So what is clear is that the normalization of monetary policy will be necessary. We all hope that uh, in, in the next years, the, 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 the fallout of the financial crisis evaporates and that we get back, back to more or less normal situation. And in a normal situation, of course, monetary policy is much too exp expansionary. But the problem is, of course, that normalizing monetary policy is a very tricky path because you have different risks on this, on this tricky path. 
The first risk is, of course, if you are too late. That's the point I just made uh, a second before, or two minutes ago. That the, ma the main reason is, uh, risk is, of course, if we are too late, we have a strong inflation risk. If the situation normalizes and M M1 and M2 start to rise, and we haven't reduced M0, then we have a huge inflation risk. But of course, if we are too early, then there is certainly a risk that we are killing off the, 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 the recovery of the economies. That was the deflation risk that was referred to uh, uh, in, in, in the speech before. There was a lot of deflation risk uh, preoccupation of, for many central bankers. Basically, the, the, the risk that you can too early cut back on, on this expansionary monetary policy and that you kill off the recovery uh, that, that starts. There is a parallel to, to the end of the 1930s where exactly something like this happened uh, in the US. So it's given the extreme liquidity, it's very hard to find the correct moment to, to cut back. Uh, and in addition, you cannot do this autonom autonomously. So you cannot just do this, the Swiss National Bank cannot just do it by looking at the situation in Switzerland. But of course you have to look at what other central banks are doing. So there are, major, there are major exchange rate risks in this normalization of the monetary policy. Um, the reason why the Swiss National Bank is still so expansionary is not so much because we have a big problem in the domestic market uh, of, 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 of uh, recession risks, but still the, the main reason is they're looking at the, at the, at the exchange rate situation. So there is no, not a possibility for the Swiss National Bank to start the normalization first. If they start first, then we have a strong appreciation of the Swiss franc. So there will be a, a kind, I mean, there will not be a coordination. Coordination of exchange rate policies that, that was tried several times in, 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 the, in the past, that's very hard to do. But of course, the central banks have to look at each other. Uh, and then there is, of course, the tricky question of the adjustment speed. If you start with the adjustment, that's the first decision. But the next decision is, of course, how quickly are you are you're increasing the short-term interest rates. When, if you do it very quickly, then you have basic, basically the risks may, maybe for financial stability that I referred to. If you do it too slowly, you, you go back to the inflation risks I, I referred to. So for me, I mean, this is the, the, biggest, mono, the biggest policy cha challenge for the next two to three years will be to get this normalization uh, process going without having major disruptions. Now let's turn to one specific point uh, of monetary policy that, that is certainly especially interesting, and this is the, the point, I come to the fourth point, uh, of negative policy interest rates. So the question, are negative policy interest rates something special? What you see here is that some central banks, here's the example of Switzerland, uh, you see that here in the, in the recent past they actually turned to negative. I like this graph because this graph basically shows you why the Swiss National Bank chose to go negative here. Here you see a little bit the, the difference. Red, you have the, the policy rates in, in Switzerland, and yellow, you have them in, in, the, uh, in, in the euro area. The blue thing here, this, this is the difference between the two. So usually the European interest rates are clearly higher than the, than the Swiss interest, in, interest rates. But what you see until 2000, end of 2014, this difference evaporated basically and when they decided to to uh, to give up the exchange rate floor at the beginning of 2015 there was basically no difference here and the evaluation of the national bank was of course that at this moment if we at the same time give free the exchange rate and have no interest rate differential between the the the, the eu and switzerland then we will have a very strong appreciation and that's the reason why at the same time they introduced this negative these negative interest rates basically to get back a little bit of blue here. And therefore, if you, look at, if, if you ask yourself the question, will the Swiss National Bank stick at these negative rates, about 0.75, or will they even go lower? You just have to look at what the ECB is doing. If the ECB is moving, then of course uh, this difference will be reduced and there could be a discussion about uh, going even, even more negative. Now, that's just what, what happened. Now, to the, to the interpretation of this to the question, are negative policy interest rates special? In a, way, in a way, you can say this was a revolution. Why was this a revolution? Well, if you look at the macro textbooks, at the macroeconomic textbooks, 
basically all the macroeconomic textbooks tell you that two, zero percent is the, is the floor of, for, for policy interest rates. Because as soon, I mean, the mic microeconomic intuition behind is very clear. As soon as you get negative, it's better to keep the, the money, uh, to keep the money under the mattress at home, to have liquidity instead of, ha of having it at the bank. So the idea was as soon as it gets negative, you have huge risks of a bank run. What, there were a lot of things that we learned about macroeconomics in the last years. What, uh, one important thing we learned is that we underestimated somewhat the transaction costs of holding money. Because there are some transaction costs of holding money, especially of holding big amounts of money. So there is a good reason that if you have a very, a little bit a small, a small negative rate, that not everybody is running to the, to the bank and get, and get its money out of, out of the bank. Of course, there are transaction costs of holding liquidity, but as, if the negative rates get too, too negative, then it's another story. So it was a revolution, but on the other hand, I mean, this argument from an economic point of view is, is also important. On the other hand, it's, it's not clear why negative rates should be so special. In a way, you can say it's a continuum of, 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 uh, uh, of, of uh, interest rates, and if they get negative, well, yeah, then they, they get negative. It's just, it's not a jump. It's just they get negative. So the question I ask here is, is the move from 0.3 to 0.1 not basically the same degree of monetary easing than if you, if you move from 0.1 to minus 0.1? It's 0.2% it's of, of a reduction in interest rates. Why is there something special about zero? What we learned here clearly is there is nothing special about zero in, the, in a sense that everybody's running to the bank and we have a, the mother of all bank runs if you have negative rates. This is something we learned. But of course, on the other hand, <clears throat> if you go back to microeconomic intuition, it's clear that there is a lower bound. If they get too negative interest rates, then it gets dangerous. And I think this is a, a slide that was used by Benoit Curry from the ECB. I, I really like this, this slide because it basically makes, makes the story. Um, most central banks, I would say, interpret the situation like this today. So the idea here is to say that here we have zero, zero nominal rate. We can reduce this zero nom nominal rates and some, we can reduce it a little bit. How much? Yeah, you have to find out, but you can reduce it a little bit, and then comes some kind of economic lower bound. Because below this economic lower bound, banks are extremely strongly hurt. Banks' profitability is, is, is strongly hurt, but without triggering a bank run. It just means that the business model of the banks gets more and more difficult. I'll come to this in a moment. And then you can probably, nobody knows how big this is here, but probably you can even go a little bit more negative, but then comes the moment where you have the physical lower ground. And the physical lower ground is really when the transaction costs of holding money are clearly lower than the costs you pay for the negative interest rates. And that's the moment where a big bank run is triggered. Conceptually, it's clear that this is the case. But of course, the big question is, what are the numbers that we have here? So how big is the central bank comfort zone? Is it minus 0.5? Is it minus 1.0? Usually, I, I ask my students, how negative sh should it be that should the interest would, if the interest rate would be minus 1%, would you give up your, money, your, your bank account? The, an the answer usually is no. The usual, the, the usual answer is it's between minus, minus 1 and minus 2%. But of course, this is just, a, I mean, I don't know whether they really act like this. But it seems to be that it's, there is a kind of a, of, of, of a comfortness to have the possibility to, to have the money in the bank and have the transactions via a bank account. But of course, there is a limit, and nobody knows where exactly that limit is. Um, <clears throat> now, to the question, why are banks uh, hurt by, by, by negative interest rates? That's, of course, something that is frequently discussed. <clears throat> Basically, the main reason is that banks do not pass these negative interest rates to, to, uh, to, to, to the customers usually, not to the, to the small customers at least. So banks do not charge uh, the, the depositors negative rates. And therefore, the interest rate difference on which most of the banks earn their money or many of the banks earn their money is squeezed. It's artificially squeezed because they, they do not pass on the negative, negative interest rates. So technically, technically this leads to a, 
I didn't find an English word for this, the passive marge, which means that the interest rates on dep deposits are then higher than the returns on assets with the same maturity. Basically, that's, that's the story behind this. This squeezes the interest rate margin. Or to put it a little bit more in general terms, it means just that the yield curve uh, becomes, dif be becomes artificially flat due to the, the, to the this fact that the interest rates are not passed on, the negative interest rates are not fully passed on. <clears throat> so that's the reason why banks especially dislike this kind of, of, of negative interest rates. And I mean, if you look at the communication of central banks, also at the Swiss National Bank, they are aware of these problems. They don't, they don't like negative interest rates. It's just that there are not so many possibilities left to avoid the, the big risk of a, of a, strong, uh, of a strong increase uh, of the Swiss franc. Here you, by the way, see the reduction of this interest margin. So the interest margin of the, these are domestic Swiss banks. It was squeezed. Here you have the introduction of these of this negative interest rates. That's a, a slide by Fritz Zubrück. And you have, a, yeah, you have some small effect, but not a very strong effect for, of, of the negative interest rates. But you have the effect. And of course, the more negative the interest rates get, the more costly it gets to not pass, pass on these, these, these effects to, 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 to the customers. OK. so. To, to summarize this, negative rates in a way are not special because, yeah, there is a, it's, it's not that it, there's a, a, certain, a, a threshold if you come to negative. The threshold argument comes fr usually from the idea that there is a zero, there's a rate below which we just have bank runs. People no longer keep their banks, uh, their, their, their money at the banks. And of course, a bank run is the biggest uh, is, is a, a very, very large risk. That's a very large risk, and for financial, for financial stability, I think I do not have to convince you that you have to avoid this at any rate, because this is basically what, what triggered the, the Great Depression, a big, big uh, splash of, of, of a big uh, wave of, of bank runs. So there is, zero is not the lower bound. It can go below zero, but we all agree it cannot be minus 5%. So you still have, and this is an important point, you still have this asymmetry for central banks. Central banks have no trouble, well, maybe they have political trouble and other troubles to fight inflation. You can basically fight inflation extremely aggressively because if inflation is high, you can just raise policy rates to 1,000% or 10,000 or whatever. There is no upper limit to how, how high you can increase policy rates. And you don't even have to do it because the markets know that there is no, no upper limit. But there is a lower limit. We learned now in the last, in the last uh, uh, years that the lower limit is not zero, but there is a lower limit. You cannot go to minus 1,000, certainly not. And you can even not go to minus 5% because then you will have bank runs all over the place. So this negative policy rates is, some, is an extreme measure in an extreme situation that most central banks, of course, don't like, but it's, a po it's one of the possibilities, one of the, I mean, it's, it goes, doesn't go as far as capital controls, which could, would be a, a, another alternative. So there, it is an instrument, but this, it's certainly an instrument that you should only use in, in very special times. But we are in very special times in, 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 this, in this situation. Okay, the last point I would like to make, the last uh, two slides are about, about the future. Um, I mean, why do we make this kind of analysis that, that I tried to, 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 to walk you through? The main point is that we try to find out from explaining what happened in the past to what is likely to happen in the future. Of course, it's extremely hard to, to know this, but you can at least make some educated guesses about, about, the, 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 uh, about the future. So I may, do not make forecasts here, but I make some arguments based on what I just said. I start with real interest rates and then go to nominal interest rates. So real interest rates, <clears throat> most of the factors that I discussed, savings, additional savings, falling investment, reductions in long-run economic growth, these three factors, most of them are, this is not something that changes very, very quickly. Most of these factors are quite persistent. Of course, they can change. I mean, we saw that they changed. That's the reason why we have this fall in real interest rates, but it's not something that, that fluctuates immensely in, in, in a short period of time. So if you ask me about the real interest rates 
next year and maybe in two years, I would say not, it's not likely that a lot happens to the real interest rates in the next one, next one to two years. They are likely to stay very low. But of course, for long-term investors, especially for pension funds or for life insurance companies, it's not the next one or two years. It's the question, of course, what happens in the next two or three decades. And here, I would tent tentatively say it's not very likely that in 20 or 30 years we will be at the same extremely low real interest rates. Because, I mean, these effects that I walked you through, the, the savings, investments, and the economic growth effects, they were, for different reasons, were special con uh, was a special con configuration that all of these arguments led to a fall in real interest rates. It's quite unlikely that this stays on for the next 20 to 30 years. Um, well, maybe that doesn't convince you because it could, could, you, could be that this is the new equilibrium. Of course this could be, but you could at least try to make some tentative arguments why it could change. One tentative argument, maybe the best argument in my, in my, in my view, is, that is the demographics argument. That's something that, I mean, forecasts are extremely difficult, but demographics are quite easily forecastable. You know a lot about the demographic development in the next 10 to, 10 to 20 years. And one thing that you clearly see in the demographic development is that this baby boomer generation will be retired in, in the next 10 to 20 years. So it's very likely that in the next 10 to 20 years we will not have this big part of the population being in the, in the work, working age, uh, in, the, in the working age, in the working age, yeah. Um, and more of them will be retired. And as soon as people retire, they of course start to, di to, to dissave. They use their savings to finance their retirement. And because you have this shift of this, of this cohort of the baby boomers to retirement, this will certainly give a, a shift to fall in savings, a fall in savings. So it's very unlikely that this extreme low, uh, extreme high supply of savings will continue for the next 20 to 30 years for this reason. I think this is the most clear-cut point we can make because we know a lot about the demographics. Of course, it's different from country to country. In some developing and emerging countries, the, the cohorts are somewhere else. But for the developed countries, the baby boomers are all basically in the same, in, in the same, in, in the same age uh, cohort. So that's one argument. The second point is, of course, about economic growth. And here, that's, of course, the, 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 the most important and the most difficult question. What happens to real economic growth in the, in the, in the longer run? And there is a very lively discussion going on among, among economists exactly about this topic. You certainly have heard, I mentioned it right before, the, the, the theory of secular stagnation. The theory of secular stagnation, there are very different uh, uh, elements of it, but the main idea is that productivity growth in the future should be smaller than productivity growth in the past. And basically, the, the, the intuitive argument is the low-hanging fruits of technologies have been detected, and now it gets more and more difficult to get more productive. It could be that this is the case, but it's of course not that easy to make this case because this is something that was already said 100 years ago. 100 years ago you had a lot of articles saying the most important things have been invented, now we have, we, it will, hard, will be hard to invent additional things. And you know what happens in the last 100 years? on technologies, technologies and productivity. So it's, it's a very bold prediction to say that, that productivity growth will really be reduced basically to zero. Because there were always new, new waves of, of technology that increase productivity in the end. And just, I mean, one of the points is uh, discussed here and in, in, in other of these fora is, is the, the, the effect of the, of the digitalization on finance, on other industries, and of course the whole this discussion about Industry 4.0. If you really think that Industry 4.0 is important, then you cannot make the forecast that productivity growth will be basically zero in the next decades. Because, I mean, the reason why you do all these new technologies is that they have huge productivity costs. Bus There's the preoccupation that Industry 4.0 will make a lot of jobs obsolete in the future. But if this is the case, I'm not so sure that this will be the case, but if this is the case, then of course productivity growth will increase. Then we will have a productivity effect, which will lead to higher growth rates in the future, not to lower growth rates in the future. So <clears throat> the assumption that the 
average economic growth in, in rich countries will in the future be as it was in the last 10 years is a very bold assumption. And I think there are very many arguments that in the next decades we at least will have the same productivity growth rates or even higher productivity growth rates due to the technology development. But nobody knows. Nobody knows. But it's just, I mean, it's a combination of that in the, in the past it was always wrong when, you, when, when it was said that there will be no new technology that will really increase productivity. That's one argument. And the second argument is the, the more countries like China and India are, in, are, are integrated in the world market, the more researchers are there around, and the more firms are there that, that try to find, to, to figure out new, new ways to do business, new technologies. And it would be very, a very negative uh, forecast to say that the productivity of these researchers will be much, much lower than the productivity of the researchers of earlier times. So the combination of all these, for, in the combination of all this, I would say that from the productivity growth side, it's unlikely that we, it's, it's likely that we will have in the next decades a, a certain increase of economic growth rates. But nobody knows, of course. So the real interest rates, to summarize this, there, I would say that it's unlikely that the real interest rates will increase strongly in the next two to three years, because these are really persistent long-term effects. But it's also quite unlikely that it will stay as low as it is for the next 20 to 30 years which is, of course, important for, for pension funds and, and, and life insurance uh, investments. So much about the real interest rates. The last point is about nominal interest rates. Well, given what we just said, what is the difference between interest, real and nominal interest rates? It's inflationary expectations. So basically, it depends on, on what happens to inflationary expectations. And here, I would say, here we can clearly not make the point that because we have a quite a persistent development in, in, the, in the past, this will be persistent in the future. This can change quite quickly. If you look at the, at the historical data, we see that inflationary expectations can really jump. They can jump and in a very short period of time. So <clears throat> it depends very much on, on, on the adjustment of, of the inflation expectations. And in the presentation before, we saw some indications that, that maybe at the at the most recent past, we already see a certain uh, shift here. Here, at least you have once the name Trump here. The Trump effect is exactly this, that, that in the inflation, it switched from deflationary expectations to inflationary expectations in a very short period of time without Trump having done anything. I mean, the, maybe the, the effect of what he's doing will, will still come. But these expectations can be quite fickle. They can quite uh, shift quite, quite, uh, uh, quite quickly. If central banks normalize too late, this normalization argument I just made before, if they normalize too late, then there is certainly a danger uh, of, of inflation. And if you ask me about my forecast, I would say there is a bigger, a, a bigger uh, danger that it's too late than it's too early. Because there is a certain tendency of the central banks to wait until the other central banks make the first step. And therefore, I think what, what is really extremely important is, is what happens to U.S., to, 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 to the Fed interest rate. Um, as you all know, they made the first step uh, more than a year ago, and then they waited for another year before they make, made the second step. I think that was quite bad news for the normalization uh, possibilities of, of monetary policy. And I really hope that now in December they made the second move, that they will indeed do uh, a couple of moves in, in this year and in next year. Because as soon as the Fed interest rate, the Fed uh, policy rates increases, it gives more freedom to the, to the rest of the central banks to actually follow, follow through and to start with the normalization process. And especially for, this, for Switzerland, it would be extremely good news if we, could have, uh, if, if we would have this, this, uh, this relaxation uh, of, of, uh, of this extremely loose monetary policy in the US. So here, if we, if we wait too long, if we have an inflationary boost, then of course the nominal interest rates can quite easily come very quickly, can very quickly increase. Not because real interest rates increase, they are quite persistent, but because inflationary expectations could increase. And of course you are thinking in nominal rates to a certain degree, especially if you are more in a, in a, in a short term mood, you think more about, about nominal rates and therefore it's not unlikely that nominal rates could shift quite quickly in the near future. It's not a, it's not a forecast, but it's a possibility uh, I would see 
uh, and I would see rather a, a danger in, in, the, in, the, in, the, yeah, in the case that you wait too long that you do it early enough. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about uh, inf interest rate, about the extra extraordinary times uh, in macroeconomics and especially in interest rate development. And I'm looking forward to possible questions. Thank you. Well, as he pointed out, this uh, audience uh, looks very much like uh, in, in the short term very often, not only 20 and 30 uh, sure. years ahead. So you said rates are unlikely to <laughs> rise in the short term in the next two to three years. Um, are higher negative rates likely in the short term, in your view? No, uh, just to, to make it clear, I, I think it's quite like, it's very, very well possible that nominal rates increase quite quickly. Mm -hmm. But just that the real rates, just the real, real rates, they are, they, they are likely to be quite flat. But the nominal rates, they could actually, they could actually uh, increase quite quickly. And this is, of course, what is relevant here, because inflationary expectations are the major point that makes short-term uh, fluctuations in the, in, in the nominal rates. But your question is about negative uh, rates. This very much, I think, depends on what the US uh, Central Bank is doing. If they follow through with the announcement of increasing stepwise the, the, the short-term interest rate, and of course here the Trump announcements make this more likely because there is some inflationary, uh, uh, inflationary impact out of these, especially if they follow through and make it, then I think it's unlikely that the negative interest rates gets more negative, that you have a but of course, if, if, the, if the US Federal Reserve waits very long and the ECB gets more and more uh, expansionary, then a certain, uh, to a certain degree, the negative rates could stay on. Mm. <coughs> As you said, for the SMB, it's uh, particularly important or it pays a lot of attention to the Swiss franc rather than to domestic problems. Do you expect the franc to weaken uh, anytime <laughs> soon? I think it's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. I mean, of course, you can say it depends on your exchange rate theory. Uh, if you look at uh, purchasing power, of course, it's over. Uh, that's the reason why we say that it's a, a strong Swiss franc. It's overrated. But of course, in the, in the short run, it's not determined by, by, by these cons considerations, but by, by financial market developments. And here, I rather think that there is a danger that we have additional, additional strengthening of the Swiss franc, because don't forget, in the last one to two years, it was quite quiet in the, Euro, in the Eurozone. The Eurozone, we didn't have these, the kind of shocks we had in 12, 13, and 14. And for me, it's quite likely that the problems in the Eurozone uh, could, could start again. And as soon as this comes, we have a strong, uh, a strong uh, uh, push on, 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 the, on the Swiss franc. Um, especially the elections in, in many, uh, it was mentioned this morning, the elections in many of uh, countries could, if, f let's, th this is just a horror scenario, but the horror scenario is that in, in Italy, uh, Cinque Stelle uh, mm. gets to power. They just announced that they will have a, a vote on Italy out of, 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 the, of the Eurozone. And Italy out of the Eurozone, that's a completely different story than Brexit. Because Brexit is about a country that ha doesn't have the Euro. They can basically split. It, it will be difficult enough, but they can split. But if a, a large Eurozone country wants to leave the Eurozone, this will lead, lead to havoc in the, in the financial markets. And then we would have strong appreciation uh, hmm. st pressure cool. on the Swiss franc. Uh, well, as I pointed out <coughs> at the beginning, um, you had a huge influence on financial market regulation in uh, well. Switzerland. Are you pleased by its results? Did they have the effect you had hoped for? <laughs> or is it too early to say? Well, that's a very, I, I could spend another hour talking about this, but uh, well, w what I think is that, that in this process, of course, nobody's perfectly happy with it, which is already quite a, a good sign in a way. Uh, uh, let's look at the too big to fail regulation. I mean, this is the one, one thing where a lot was, was done. There, I'm, I'm actually quite happy with what happened in, in the second round of, uh, I mean, we had the first round in 2012, 2013. We had our second round, we really, especially for the two big banks, incre increased leverage ratio quite strongly. Um, this was a difficult process, but I think this, in, in the longer run, this makes, the Switzerland is so much exposed to this too big to fail problem, this makes this increases stability uh, mm. quite a lot, uh, quite to, 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 to a major extent. Of course, I know that the sector says that th there is a regulatory initiative and uh, there is a, a flood of regulations. I completely understand this. But on the other hand, you have to understand that the financial crisis was not something uh, that you forget in two minutes. I mean, the problems that came up in the financial crisis led to this flood of regulation. And what we tried in this process is 
to add these necessary regulations without stifling completely the, 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 the dynamics in the sector. Whether this, whether this results were good or not, it's hard for me to say. I was too much involved. But I think compared to other countries, it wasn't too bad a process. And maybe a last point. Uh, mm -hmm. In the last presentation, there was a discussion of uh, uh, financial regulation in the US may be getting lighter and this of course in the short term and for for the big banks this could be good news but in the longer term this would be very bad news I mm. mean if if the US uh, big banks would start to to redo what they did before the financial crisis I mean this would create havoc in the long run mm. would be bad news not good news <coughs> any more questions from the audience there is one in the second row if we could have a microphone Yes, uh, you said that the big challenge is that you find the right point for normalization of the monetary policy. And you also argued that the uh, central banker will be too late and too early. If you would be a central banker, how would you find the optimal point to react? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. I mean, it, it gives me the opportunity to make one point clear. It's very easy to make these kind of presentations, say you have to find the correct moment to do this. And it's extremely hard to do it because we are in a situation we, have, we were never before. I mean, this kind, of, this kind of liquidity flood was never out there. And there was never the situation that we have to, I mean, you, look, you saw the figures. We, we have to not half it, but to, to, to go by a factor of five down. And to do this in a, in a, in a way that is not disruptive for the financial markets and for, for real development. It was never done before, and it will be very hard. Um, therefore, it's, I would never uh, say that something goes wrong. Uh, just, I would never forecast that this, this would go wrong. But what I would like to say is that there could be a certain tendency to wait too long because for a very good reason, people, the, the, the central bankers say, I cannot be the first to do the move because if I do the move, I have a strong appreciation of, of, of my currency. You see the discussion right now in, in the US. I mean, even there, there's a discussion now. There was a very small increase of the Federal Reserve uh, interest rates, and already there is a discussion that this could lead, uh, trigger a, an appreciation of the, of the US dollar, and therefore are already people who say we should wait until we do the next. And this kind of discussion takes place in, in all the central banks, and, and this, the ideal situation would be a coordinated move, but coordinated moves in exchange rate policy that was uh, tried before and this was never successful. So it's really a very hard task, and we, we can just hope I mean, I, I'm sure about the technical abilities of the, of the, of the central banks. I really hope that pol politicians leave them alone because that, that mm. they really have the monetary the, the independence to do what is necessary because in a way, the central banks have to be extremely po unpopular in the future because what they are doing, it was very popular to reduce the interest rates. It will not be that popular to increase them, but it's necessary in order to, to stifle these, these, these uh, possible dangers for inflation. So timing is tricky, speed is tricky. Yeah. Uh, question in the first row. Thank you. So um, on the ECB's quantitative easing program, what is your assessment related to the communicated objective to lift inflation to 2%? Mm. Well, it is already, I mean, the ECB uh, objective is close to, below, but close to 2%. Um, to put it to 2% wouldn't be too much uh, uh, a move. But of course, there is also discussion to have 3 or 4%. There are eminent economists that, who, who say this. Um, <clears throat> I'm rather skeptical to do it, but more on a, on a, on a point that there is so much going on now in, in monetary policy, and there are so big uh, uh, challenges ahead that you should only change the things that are really necessary to, to change. And if you change really, if you would go, go from 2 to 4%, it would really, I mean, you are com in completely uncharted territory. You don't know what this exactly means for inflationary expectations. In the past, it was always the case when inflation increased above 3%, that inflationary expectation get more, get, got a problem, and it was very hard to get it back. It, it cost, usually it costed a recession to get it back. So, and what we also learned is that zero is not really the, the lower bound. There is a certain possibility to go a little bit more negative. So, 
combining all this, I understand the intellectual idea of it. If you go to three or four percent, you have more of a caution against, you have the possibility to, to, to reduce interest rates. But I think the transition would be quite tricky and we are in uncharted territory anyway, and this would be an additional, uh, an, an additional step in uncharted territory. I would avoid it. Okay. It's been very interesting. Uh, are there one more? Okay, final question, third row. Is it possible to do the normalization in a dynamic way? That you, for instance, have a little bit higher interest rate, and look what is the reaction of the market. Of course, you cannot see forward what is exactly the reaction of the market. Yeah. You have the international players, and they maybe do uh, contrary things. But you can prepare prepare before the reaction of the central bank or when the international players are reacting in this way or in another way. Yeah. You, can, you can think about what's going on when you ha have higher interest rate, what's going on with the, uh, with the industry, how can you react to that. Yeah. And so you have a whole, uh, a, whole uh, uh, a lot of material to put in the market, to yeah. show the market what you want and when it's going the wrong way, you also can correct. And so slowly, uh, slowly, correct. No, no, I, I completely, I mean, in a way that's, in a way you are describing what is done right now. The, you, the, the, Fed, the Fed basically does this. I mean, they, they raised it um, in end of 2014, I think, by a quarter of percent, and then they waited very long before making the next move. In a way, it's, it's Given the, the liquidity we have here, we could say, no, we shouldn't make moves of a quarter of percent, but just of percents. I mean, we reduce them by one, two, three percent in a very short period of time, but we will never raise them by one, two, three percent in a short period of time, exactly for the reason you, you, you are making, for, for the point you are making, that with the smaller steps, you, you have a certain possibility to react. But of course, it's a tricky thing, because it could be that the inflationary expectations rise quite quickly and that you should make bigger, bigger steps and these bigger steps then could, because they never happened before, it could be quite tricky to do this. But in a way I agree that a, a kind of trial and error process is necessary. But of course one thing is what you do with the interest rates, the other is what you do with communication. And uh, it, it will be not easy to, to align these interest rate movement with the communication given this extreme liquidity I showed you. So it's. I would say most central banks would agree with what you are saying, and they, they would say they are already doing what you, what you are saying. But uh, the question is just, will this be enough? Professor Brunetti, thank you very much. It was great to have you here. Thanks for your insights. Thank you very much. Round of applause for thank Professor you. Brunetti, please.